as part of the British plan for colonial expansion, the British High Commissioner for Southern Africa, Sir Henry Bartle Freyer, issued an ultimatum to King Ketchweo with the intention of instigating a war, ordering him, amongst other things, to disband his Zulu army and discontinue the Zulu military system. When this ultimatum expired a month later, Freya ordered Lord Chelmsford, the Commander-in-Chief of the British forces, to proceed with the invasion of Zululand. On the 11th of January 1879, Chelmsford, with the British Army's central column, crossed the Buffalo River at Rourke's Drift, in the British colony of Natal, into Zululand, leaving B Company, 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment of Foot, commanded by Lieutenant Gronville Bromhead to garrison the post. Rourke's Drift had been converted into a supply depot and hospital under the command of Major Spalding. A company of between 100 and 350 men of the Natal native contingent were also stationed at the post. A company from the 1st Battalion, 24th Regiment of Foot, was ordered to Rourke's Drift from Helpmaker, some 10 miles away to the southeast, to further reinforce the position. Lieutenant John Chard had arrived from Isan Luana to repair the pontoon bridge on the Buffalo River at Rourke's Drift. At around noon on the 22nd of January, Major Spalding left for Helpmaker to ascertain the whereabouts of the reinforcements from the 1st Battalion, which were now overdue. He placed Chard in temporary command. A short while later, Lieutenant Ardendorf, from the Natal native contingent, arrived from Isan Luana, bearing news of the defeat and to inform Chard that part of the Zulu Impi was about to attack Rourke's Drift. Following a short meeting with the commanding officers, it was decided against withdrawing to help Mika, with their slow-moving ox carts full of sick and wounded, which could easily be overtaken and destroyed by the approaching Zulus. Therefore, it was agreed that the only sensible course of action was to make a stand and fight. Chard and Bromhead began directing their men to construct a four foot high defensive perimeter wall out of melee bags, which incorporated the storehouse, the hospital and the stone corral. These buildings were fortified with loopholes knocked through the external walls and the external doors were barricaded. With many clear fields of fire, a rocky slope protecting the north wall and some ditches protecting the south wall the British, with their Martini Henry breech loading rifles, were in a reasonably strong defensive position. The British soldiers were positioned around the perimeter, along with those from the Natal native contingent who possessed firearms. The remainder of the Natal native contingent, who were armed with spears and shields, were positioned inside the stone wall corral. At around 3.30 in the afternoon, a troop of about a hundred Natal native horse arrived, having retreated in good order from Isan Luana. They volunteered to picket the far side of the Oscarberg, a large hill that overlooked Rourke's Drift, and from behind which the Zulus were expected to make their approach. Adendorf also stayed, while the trooper who had ridden in with him set off to warn the garrison at Helmika. The approaching Zulu force numbered between 3,000 and 4,000 warriors, none of which were engaged during the battle at Isan Luana. They had been ordered into a position to prevent the retreat of the British back to Natal at Rourke's Drift. Most of the Zulu warriors were armed with a short spear and a shield made of cowhide. Some Zulus were armed with old muskets and rifles. Although their marksmanship, quality of ammunition and weapons maintenance was generally poor. 
commanding the Zulu force was Prince Dabalumanzi, half-brother of the Zulu king Kechweo. Prince Dabalumanzi was considered an aggressive leader and was about to violate King Kechweo's orders not to attack the British when in fixed positions and not to invade the British colony of Natal. The fighting began at about 4.20 p.m. with the mounted Natal native contingent positioned behind Oscarburg briefly engaging the vanguard of the Zulu army. However, being fatigued and short of ammunition, they soon departed for Helmika. Upon witnessing their withdrawal, the Natal native contingent at Rolf's Drift abandoned the corral and fled, greatly reducing the strength of the defending garrison. Now, with fewer men, Chard gave the orders to modify the defences. A biscuit box wall was constructed through the middle of the yard in order to make it possible to abandon the hospital side of the drift if the need arose. They also constructed a nine foot high redoubt from mealy bags adjacent to the corral and the storehouse. At around 4.30 p.m. the Zulu vanguard attacked the south wall which joined the hospital and the storehouse. The majority of the Zulus swept around to attack the north wall and began a harassing fire from the terraces of Oscarburg. The British were soon engaged in fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting. In a few places, the Zulus managed to drive the British off the walls, but were soon driven back. Chard realised that the north wall could not be held, and at 6pm he withdrew his men back behind the biscuit box wall. Fighting around the hospital continued, during which it caught fire, making it untenable to defend. As many men as possible were evacuated, but some patients perished in the flames. As night fell, the Zulu attacks continued. The corral came under attack and was evacuated at about 10 p.m leaving the remaining men in and around the redoubt and the storehouse. Throughout the night, the Zulus kept constantly attacking the British positions. Their attacks only began to slacken after midnight and finally ended by 2 a.m., being replaced by harassing gunfire until 4 a.m. The British were exhausted having fought for the better part of 10 hours and were running low on ammunition. Of the 20,000 rounds originally available to the British, only 900 remained. At dawn, the Zulus had gone. Patrols were sent out to scout the battlefield and look for survivors. At 7am, the Zulus suddenly reappeared. However, no attack materialised as the Zulus were fatigued, having been on the move for six days prior to the battle and having not eaten properly for two. Soon after their appearance, they left for good. At around 8 a.m., the vanguard of Lord Chelmsford's relief column appeared. After the battle, 351 Zulu bodies were counted. Having witnessed the carnage at Isan Luana, the British relief force had little mercy for any captured or wounded Zulus. As a result, it has been estimated that at least 500 Zulus might have been massacred. The British casualties were 14 dead, and with almost every man having some kind of wound. 11 Victoria Crosses were awarded to the defenders of Rourke's Drift. Seven of them to soldiers of the 2nd Battalion, 24th Foot, the most ever received for a single action by one regiment. This high number of awards for bravery has been interpreted by several historians as a way of extolling the victory at Rourke's Drift as means of drawing the public's attention away from the defeat at Isanawana. 
and the fact that Lord Chelmsford and Sir Henry Bartle Freya had instigated the war without the approval of the British government. However, some historians have challenged this assertion and pointed out that the victory stands on its own merits, regardless of other concerns.